everyone. Welcome back to Teacher Quit Talk. We're here to talk about the government. We are, but I also need to hear about like, your life. Like, how's school going? So much has happened. I've lived yeah. 900,000 lives since we recorded this podcast. <laughs> The start of school, I have just come to the conclusion that the first three weeks of school are a test that Jesus is sending to me directly, that the God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are like, all right, we're going to take the month of August and try and tear you down as much as physically possible in a way where you feel like a shell of a person that's just full of Celsius and anger. And then oh we're just going to see where you go from that. And it's August 21st, so I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm not telling you all this to complain. I'm just telling you so you can know how strong I am. So mm -hmm. I'm on week three of kids being back, week four of me being back. Week one, I walk in my room, the AC is not working. For reference, it's been like 98 degrees outside. My classroom, it's it's cooled down a little bit in the last week, so it's not as unbearable. But for over a week straight, it was over 87 degrees in my room every single day. So that was like fun little chaos number one. Fun little chaos number two is I got really sick during pre-planning week. And I think I might have been sick from the mobile AC unit they put in my room because I got sick the day they put it in there. And when they first put it in, it was attached to the ceiling. So I think it was literally just yanking out like 40 years of dust and asbestos and ceiling tile chunks and blasting them into my room. Because once I started wearing a mask, it got a lot better. And then I convinced the custodian to put the AC out the window because it wasn't working because it's literally just taking hot air from the ceiling and then shoving it back into the room like there was no actual circulation happening. So I convinced him to put it out the window and he used duct tape and cardboard to do it, which shows me that he has a can do attitude because he did not let the fact that we did not have the supplies for that stop him. I think because I was being so annoying. So that improved it as well. And then now I am unfortunately best friends with our district's HVAC manager, because if I'm going to have a bad time, I'm going to get in that staff directory and you're going to have a bad time too. So this man who is an HVAC specialist, we, me and him email every day. We're feeling good. He just ordered me a window unit because he said the part that they needed to replace the AC on the roof is like six months on back order. So he ordered me like a apartment style window unit. And I said, I do not give a what you do as long as you get some cold air in here. So thanks That's so much, sir. Crazy. So that was demon number two I'm facing. Demon number three I'm facing because we're amongst friends and I know I can talk freely. Um, my school started doing PLCs. Last year, what we did is you had to meet with your subject area team, which for me, that's only one other person. You had to meet once a week after school for 30 minutes. Me and my subject area person always did it. Me and her were always good. Like we would give the kids the same test so we can compare data. Like me and her had it together, but apparently a ton of other people were just not doing it. Like everyone would just leave right when school ends. So now we get to meet twice a week for a full hour during our planning period. So, and the real fun kicker for me, I teach two courses. So that means I'm losing a lot of planning time for a class that I only have one section of when my other class that I have two sections of and I'm the only teacher for has essays. So I don't use most of my planning time for planning. I use it for grading. And then the other cherry on top of that is like it's making me realize how truly ADHD I am because I just cannot focus in there. Like I try and show up and do work and it just takes me so long to get anything done. And I was like legitimately sobbing over it on Monday because I also just like I cannot be around people from eight to three. I can't do it. And I was like debating going to my principal and talking to her about it. But then I found out it wasn't her decision. It's our area superintendent. So I was like, there's not even anything she can do to help me right now. So I'm just going to wait till they ask for feedback and then I'll give it then. But it's just been like 
a really awful adjustment and it's been really emotionally difficult because it's having such a negative impact on my instruction that I feel like a failure and I like came into this year with a lot of goals to get better I feel like in my fifth year teaching I should be getting better not worse but because I'm losing so much planning time I'm having to grade things on completion without even reading it I'm having to show videos during class like stuff that normally I don't like to do I'm doing a lot so I'm trying to figure out like how I can change things, what I can do to like mitigate this because I know the intention behind PLCs is to make me better, not worse. So the fact that it's making me worse in so many tangible, measurable ways that I have documentation of, once they ask for feedback, I'll be happy to share. Because like I said, when we did that 30 minutes, I actually really liked that. Like we got a lot out of it, but it's just to the point now it's so much of my day. It's just having such an awful impact and I... And being less candid about this on TikTok and stuff, because I don't want to get in trouble. But if my administrators are listening to this podcast, you're probably deep enough down the rabbit hole that you're loyal to me. So just know I'm literally fighting for my life. And this morning, my principal was like, oh, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm here. And she was like, are you okay?" And I was like, I'm just trying to fight through PLCs right now. I'm trying to fight through and get to the other side. And the she didn't say anything. But what she communicated with one look showed me, I see you. And we're, I know, I know, I know. So that's why I didn't even bother going to like sit down and cry in her office. Cause I was like, I, okay, she knows what's wrong. Yeah. Like she gets it. And that's so hard. I mean, like, I think the worst part of all is that you can't focus in there because my first suggestion would be to just be a warm body in that room and check out and do what you need to do on your computer. Like pull a veteran teacher with it and be like, yeah. So that's what. I tried today. Today went a little bit better because we're in like week three now. So I feel like I'm in it enough to have an opinion about it. It's not like I just wrote it off the first day. And I realized I cannot plan in there. I just can't focus. But today, instead of planning, I brought grading with me and veteran teacher and that takes a little less mental power so that I was able to like do it pretty fast because I realized part of the reason I can't focus in there and I can't plan in there is like a the noise but in my classroom next to my desk I have all my student groups I have the like layout of my room I have the testing calendar and I have all the standards printed and on the bulletin board so I can plan really quick because I'm just glancing back and forth And all the stuff's already there. But when I was trying to plan in that room just on my laptop, I'm like, oh, where's the testing calendar? Where's this? So I like just felt like I kept getting hung up and I wanted to like zoom. Like you're like me. Once you get like the mental zoomies and you're working, like you're cooking. And I just could not do that in there. You really have had a hell of an August. Like we, this past month has been a blur because it's been so crazy just in general. Yeah. Tell about your crazy if you want to. I think I did end up talking a little bit about it on different podcast episodes just because I've been so frantic, but I everything's fine now. I mean, I had like crazy death threats. I had to go to court. And then now the biggest issue is that I have like media people that are like deeply invested in this stuff, which is I'm not used to that to the point where like it's like tabloid people are like talking about like they're trying to get court records and they're trying to like make public details of the case that I don't necessarily want to be public. But because there's like, you know, freedom of information or whatever, they can just get whatever they want. And that's really scary to me. I feel like I went through this situation of like being doxxed and being threatened and like all this stuff that I'd really never experienced before. Now, in an effort for people to quote unquote raise awareness, they're like victimizing me in another way. Like it's like my yeah, I get exactly privacy what you was mean. invaded and then I had to take legal action and now more people are invading my privacy to get the details of that. And that's like bothersome to me but I mean everything like I said everything's chill now I just had like a work trip yesterday I'm just so tired I feel like I'm gonna be catching up on work for the next like year of my life after this I was thinking about that the other day that I was like if you had like a I don't want to say a normal job but like a traditional like office job Mm -hmm. you would have literally had to take like FMLA or a leave of absence yeah there's no way I mean I literally was supposed to start grad school four days ago and I am trying I I I can't obviously so I don't know it's crazy whoops that's the great thing about grad school is it'll always be there they will always be there to take your money they're weird about it though they're like like you have to take a leave of absence you can't just leave which is so weird to me I thought you just didn't sign up and then you could just come back but they're like no we're cohort based so you can't just leave and come back 
And I'm like, well, what are you going to do? Just like, I don't know. What's We're the plan there? We're based. That feels like when people talk about crypto, like shut you made yeah. that up, so I'll be in a different cohort. Yeah. Are like, you still do you? School? Yeah. I hate it. I hate it so bad. It pisses me off so bad every day, but it's literally fine because I don't care about the material at all. So it's fine that I'm not learning anything and I'm not yeah, paying for it. I have a federal grant, so I, yeah. I'm viewing it as a very transactional approach. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's all I need from them is a piece of paper. Amen. So, and did I tell you about how I have to have like a mentor? No. For grad school? No, what's going on? So you have to, because it's like a grad school certification program, you have to have like a designated mentor who's a teacher, like licensed teacher or whatever. So you have to have like a designated person at your school site that like is a licensed person to verify your hours and provide feedback and whatever. So I didn't feel like getting an administrator to do it because they're busy and they have stuff to do. So they said you could ask your department head. I have two department heads. So I asked the one that's next door to me who's awesome. And he was like, you should ask so-and-so to do it instead because they've done it before and they'll be able to help you and all this stuff. And I was like, listen, I'm kind of looking for someone to sign papers and not ask questions. And I think that you really fit that job description. And I literally am like forcing him to do it. And then I had to have all the kids turn in a media release because I have to film me teaching. And he had to sign it, too. And the kids were like, why did he sign this? And I was like, exactly. Exactly. Damn, nothing gets past them. <laughs> what the heck? Well, they were all confused because like I, me and him had to sign the front and they and their parents had to sign the back. So I passed it out and they were like, you already signed it. You already signed it. And I was like, read, use your eyes and read. You <laughs> see how it says teacher signature? That's me. You sign where it says student. These kids. The literacy crisis is a crisis for a reason. Use your eyeball. It is. We are in crisis. We are. Oh my gosh. Speaking of crises, let us dive into our topic at hand, which is Title I. Title I. Is there a specific thing about Title I you wanted to talk about? Because I really am here to learn. I should know more. I work at a Title I school. Well, first of all, the first thing that always comes to mind is the white ladies on tiktok i teach at a title one school and then they go on just to say just perhaps the most racist shit you've ever heard in your life and i'm like or where it'll be like different types of students at title one schools oh and i'm God. like there should be one type actually two students that are within the poverty threshold and students that are above the poverty threshold unless it's that so was weird. your type i don't really i'm not really interested i just don't understand is it because it's so strange to me. I don't know, maybe if just because I have taught exclusively in Los Angeles, but it, it feels weird when people talk about Title I schools in such a way because I'm like, is this a dog whistle that you're just saying that it's diverse, like racially or what? Because I feel like every school think... in LA is very diverse. So there's not like a, I don't know. It's weird to hear them say that. Yeah. I think it is a dog whistle. I think because in especially cities that are really, really segregated, it's like yeah. the minority schools are the title one and the white schools are not title one. So I think yeah, maybe that's, that's where it comes from. And I think in LA, the geography is just a little bit different. So it doesn't really shake out like that. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of where it comes from. And I think it's also sometimes just like anti-poor. Because I've heard people use Title I derogatorily towards predominantly white schools, but schools that are like like the stereotypical like country redneck, like low class trailer park vibe. Like, so I used to live in like a rural area and there was like three main schools there. Or no, there's four. There's the private school. There's a charter school. There's a really like high end public school, like it's in a very wealthy neighborhood. And then there's a really big public school that is a Title I school that serves more like rural communities, some trailer parks, people that live in like very rural areas. Like a lot of kids have to come far to go to that school. And people refer to it as the Title I school. My and Lord. they mean it like those are the poor kids poor because kids. like the other kids are pretty much all rich at either the charter doesn't have busing. So you have to have someone who has the job flexibility to provide that transportation. So most of those people are going to be better off economically. The private one, obviously, if you have no money, you can't do that. 
And then the other public one is only for this like very small neighborhood that's very rich and it's just a much smaller school. See, this is stuff like this is why when I got on TikTok, I very quickly stopped talking in absolutes about things because I would say something about a school that I'm used to. And then people in like middle America would be like, that is literally nothing like what our schools are like. So the norm for me is so different from the norm from you or somebody else. And on our subject of Title I, uh, something mm-hmm. funny happened on TikTok the other day. I posted about how my school didn't give us paper this year, and which is whatever. That's not what we're here to talk about. I got some. <laughs> Someone gave me some. Oh, not good. I will admit, not a lot, but they did give me some. But anyway. I thought you didn't I get paper video. before. No. So last year, they dropped off like a big box of paper to oh, all of us. Oh. I just went through yes. it really fast. And then this year, I didn't even realize we didn't get paper because I had some left over from last year. So I just didn't really think about it. I just like took it out of the closet and started using it. And then another teacher made a joke about it to me. And I was like, oh, yeah, we didn't get paper this year. And that's what my video was about was about like, I was like, oh, I'm so out of touch. I didn't even realize for like two weeks that I hadn't given us paper because of my Amazon wish list. But anyway, <laughs> someone commented and they were like, you should try working at a Title I school. And I was like, this is a Title I school. But they meant it. Oh they said, like, you should try working at a Title I school. They get federal funds for supplies. Like, they Which, meant it positive, not negative. Not like, but that's you not should even try. They works. meant it, like, as a genuine. They do get money because that's why I was eager to talk about Title I here. Because my school used our money last year on a lot of supplies. And, like, some things we could use it for and some we couldn't. But I heard that Title I got cut a lot. So I was like, maybe that's why we didn't get paper this year. So I was like, Title this is did. a good episode for me to investigate because I know my school gets a lot of Title I funding. They said they have to use it for instructional resources. So some materials we can use it on, but some we can't because like it got approved to get like folders, note cards, things like that. But like we couldn't use it on some digital resources that we wanted. Like it was yeah. very strict about it. Yes. So the, the the reason that I said it doesn't even work like that is because I've been at Title I schools where I'm just like, where's, sorry, I just smacked that. Where's the money? Like you're saying? Yeah, no, literally. You know that you have funds for this from the government themselves, but where is it? They because gave it to I you. Don't have what do you mean I don't have pencils? What do you mean I have to check out? I got in trouble because I didn't write down on a form that I took one pack of post-its and it wasn't even like i took it out of the supply closet it was literally that somebody was like somebody in the office was like oh here you go girl here's your pack of post-its that you need and i was like oh thanks Got in trouble. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you so crazy? And then you request something and it takes like months. So I remember at my old school was also Title I. And one time I asked, I was like, hey, can we ask for Title I funding for something? Because I wanted to get, for each kid in my class, I wanted note cards and a little ring. So they would have like a little uh- ring of all the vocab words to study for the EOC. And so I was like, oh, that'd be a good use of Title I funding, like very instructional material. They gave me a form I had to fill out, write a whole page about what it was going to be used for, and then present it at an in-person meeting that only occurred twice a year at the school site from 5 to 6 p.m. And at that school, our school day ended at 2.15 and they were like, oh, well, you missed the meeting. So you can, the next one is in four months. It's by design. It is by design. Yeah. That's, I always sound like a conspiracy theorist when I say like that, but it really is. And at that school, I thought I was like, oh, like I didn't know better back then. So I was like, oh, it's federal funding. I know the federal government's really strict. But at my new school, my department head used to be our Title I coordinator. And she literally just emails us and is like, what do you want? You email her a wish list and she replies and tells you what we can get and what we can't. And she does it a couple times a year. And so if you ask at like not one of the times, she'll say like, yeah, it's just going to take a while. And we try and like work it out in the meantime. But like there's no form. There's no meeting. There's no presentation. There's no groveling, begging, pleading on the ground. That's actually in the formal thing from the government. That's in like the yeah. how to access the funding. You have to grovel a little bit. Yeah. And Joe Biden wrote it. So the interesting thing is House Republicans last year were pushing for an 80% cut to Title I funding, which is insane, but 25% was proofed. That was my paper. That was the 25% they cut was Mm -hmm. my paper delivery. Yep. Yes. So that is the fiscal year plan for 2025. Overall, 
a house has approved an 11% overall cut to the U.S. Department of Education, but uh, funding for Title I low-income schools is going to see a 25% cut in spending, which is actually a $4.7 billion reduction. Exactly what low-income schools need, a $4.7 billion reduction in funding. I was just looking around today and saying, we have $4.7 billion too much. I wish they would take it out of here. These kids are spoiled. Yeah, with and their what's chairs, the, right? And notebook paper. And this does a little bit coincide with the end of ESSER funds from COVID. So I'm going to get minorly political, but House Republicans, obviously the House is controlled by the Republican Party, and they are saying the decline in funding is actually because of, um, you know, these this COVID funding is going away. For me, the the kicker of this is that this cut is going to result in 72,000 fewer teaching positions. Oh, that's not good. No. That is not good. Yeah, it's it's bleak. Luckily, they didn't get the 80% cut that they wanted to Title I. If we know one thing about Republicans, they're tenacious. I wish the left had the tenacity of the right. This is a $10 billion cut from what the... Um, Democrats have proposed. Uh, they proposed $82 billion. Democra uh, Republicans proposed $72 billion. And at the end of the day, we all lose. Speaking of funding in schools, the power went out at my school today very briefly. It was fine. I don't really know what happened. It was out for like 10 minutes. But this other teacher, he's so funny. He meant it as a joke. So no one think he was serious. Walks into my room and goes, all right, guys, looks like we didn't pay the power bill, so I'm going to walk around. If everyone could give $1 to $2, I take Cash App or cash so that we can pay this power bill and get these lights on. And that is called an entrepreneur, and, you know, good for them. And I was laughing, and I was like, that's a good joke, but I feel like we're not far from it. I feel like maybe in five years it won't be a joke. Right, I know, I know, for real. And then because kids aren't great at reading the room, some of them thought he was serious and took their wallets out. And I was like, y'all, Mr. Away. Man is joking. I was like, do not give him money. I was like, he has a very nice car. You do not need to give him money. Oh, my gosh. Do you want to hear a dramatic story that's in the news right now about Title I? Yes. Okay, amazing. So in Oklahoma City, there is their department is called the Oklahoma State Department of Education. And all of a sudden, their funding allocations dropped to zero this week because the department miscalculated the funds, but they're calling it a glitch. So which is it? Did you miscalculate or did the like wait, system wait. mess up what happened repeat that How, they well, lost okay. the money what happened it said so they logged in in the morning so the superintendents log in in the morning to check their title one distributions of money and it showed on monday of this week that the funding was at zero. So they like logged in to be like, how many teachers can we employ this school year? And it was like, none. <laughs> they had a Zoom call to like talk about it and they gave the freaking audio to the news, which I think is so petty. So there is like an argument of like, was this actually a miscalculation or like, is it really just a glitch in the system? And it's just so... It it's just so what we deal with in the education system on a daily basis, I feel like. It's like, I, I could be in that meeting. Because like, the I could way, see that happening. one of my pet peeves of not, it's very prevalent in education, but it's happened in other industries as well. When people say, oh, it was a glitch, and they imply that it's solved now and not a problem, but it never is. They're like, oh, that was a glitch that we're still going to feel the consequences of and get no money. And they're like, yeah. And you're like, cool. So we're just, that's the plan. I know. And you know what's really funny? It's like you didn't want to call somebody? Right? Well, should I perhaps explain what Title I is? What if somebody doesn't know, I guess? Yeah. Give, give an explanation to the non-teachers or the people that have only lived in rich communities. So, Elementary and Secondary Education Act it was signed a long, long time ago. And it was amended by Obama. And he called this, like, act the Every Student Succeeds Act, the SEA. Title I was amended as part of that. And Title I gives extra money to school districts or school sites for children from low-income families. And the idea is that this extra funding will increase equity. So, like, 
obviously equality is everybody gets the exact same thing and equity is like if somebody needs a little extra help to get to the baseline where everybody else is they're going to get that little extra something it's not technically equality it's equity so that's like what title one funding is for it's an opportunity for these kids to get fair and high quality education and to close educational achievement gaps because there's like a lot of research that shows that if kids have for example a parent at home to help them with their homework or they have a tutor or they do extracurricular activities on and on and on and on and on there's so many ways there's so many ways that extra money can help kids succeed so this being put into their schools is obviously a good thing i feel like i don't have to explain why the extra money in schools is a good thing so the money that is given by title one goes to leas local education agencies and is annually updated because every year they reevaluate the poverty estimates that are put out by the census u.s census you know like where everybody reports all their shit so then there's different amounts of money that go to different schools it's like a whole mathematical magical experience i'm sure um and the it's like they, down to the cent because i don't it's i won't very share specific. it because i don't remember it but my old principal my new one hasn't done this he would put on a projector how much we had like to the cent and he'd be like this is them. how much money we got <laughs> Good and for it would him. always be like a specific ass number. Yeah, it's really specific. We love a transparent king. Yeah, like literally the total 50 states, like all the money. It says supporting effective instruction state grants 2022, $2,170,080. So it's like very, very specific. So a Title I school can have a school-wide program, targeted assistant program, program or no Title I program. And there are, like, it's based on kids who receive free or reduced lunch. So yeah. that's like the. So easy that's, way I to think, why that they have to update it every single year. Cause, like, yeah. that's what I always thought it was, is it was based on the percentage of students that eat free and reduced lunch. And I know, like, school populations can change really dramatically within one year. Cause maybe a new yeah. neighborhood got built, apartments got taken down, or something like there can be a big change in one calendar year because I know some people don't think it should be renewed every year. Like it should be yeah. once you're in, you're in. But I get why they do assess it every year. Yes. And I didn't realize that not all schools that are eligible do it. I thought like if, if you're a school that's eligible, you're going to get it automatically. And that's not necessarily true. Why would you not do it? Well, it says, <laughs> however, not all Title I eligible schools participate in Title I programs due to rules governing within LEA at allocations and state and district flexibility for allocating title one funds so from what i from that sentence if i'm understanding it correctly it could be like your district gets title one funds because your district gets it but then your school site within your district might not give it to you because of the demographic of your specific school site if i'm reading it right I think so i also know because like the paperwork behind title one is really a huge undertaking it yeah. makes sense that maybe in small schools, you don't have a school site person that does it. So many noises are happening right now. You don't have a school site person that does it. It's just a district person. So I guess, yeah, the logistics might shake out differently. Because I, I can't imagine anyone just being like, nah, I'm good. Keep that I, money. I don't need it. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. There's no world in which I think you would say that. But I think like some teachers take teaching at title one like a little badge or like a feather in their cap and they're like i'm a badass because i teach at title one when really what they mean is like i teach at an urban school or i teach at a diverse school or i teach at a poor school like a like you know like they don't title one doesn't really tell you enough so it's like what are you actually saying no, teachers will literally act like they were a pow like yes, they will act like, like they just came back from like a tour in Iraq and yeah. like they saw the most horrific things. I'm like, oh, you mean where you were coloring pictures with children? Yeah. That's it's, what you're referring to? <laughs> that's why it's really weird to me, I think specifically, because like I mentioned previously, I find it weird and often racist, but I, I can't ever put my finger on what they mean. So I'm always just like, what do you mean by Title I? Because I've, I've taught in Title I every year except for one. 
And they're all very, they were all very different experiences. Yeah, that's what I was to say. Like, so, so, so many schools um, are Title I schools that yeah. it doesn't make sense to even use it as like a stereotype or insult because. Like, let me Google what percentage of schools are Title I because so many of them are so different. Like, you have urban schools, rural schools, diverse schools, not diverse schools. Like, it just isn't – it's just so common. That's like have being like everyone with brown hair is this way. It's just such a common trait that you can't make a sweeping generalization about it. In the what school year 2021 to 22, mm -hmm. 63% of traditional public schools were Title I eligible. Yeah, you can't generalize when it's 63 <laughs> percent like so if you'd be like it was title one you mean like the majority of everyone else perfect stand in line please yeah that's a really good point i'm gonna use that statistic i'm taking that it's yours it's all yours what's the source on that that's the national center for education statistics.gov so i'm i'm gonna guess they have their hand on the pulse they're gonna be in the know about that one so what i'm reading about now is some people have called title one what did they say here the manhattan institute calls title one a clunky overbroad failure and they say low-income students deserve better and even just like skimming through this, my impression is that students in general just deserve better. Like, I think that the issue perhaps is not necessarily squarely on the shoulders of Title I. Like, I think the allocation of funding from actual Department of Education is the issue versus like yeah. Title I is a program like it's, it's being a band -aid. quote unquote a failure. Correct. It's like the yeah. system itself is broken and Title I is meant to fix that by filling in these gaps where socioeconomic students are disadvantaged systemically. Sorry, I'm using a lot of big words and people get really mad at me when I say that. Like, don't let them get mad. I don't know what how to Fight say it another it. way. So like the systems that are in place in public schools are broken because they punish students for not being like rich or whatever or like affluent. But the issue in my opinion is that the way schools are districted the way that lines are drawn is the issue because poor schools stay poor rich schools stay rich and get richer and the poor schools get poorer as a result you know what i mean like to me that's the issue of funding yeah and it's also those poor schools staying poor and a rich school staying rich are also like self-fulfilling cycles because if a, there is a rich school parents that have means are going to figure out a way to get their kid into the quote unquote better school. And then yep. if there's a poor school, parents that have means are going to figure out a way to get their kid out of that school. So then the only people left are the people that did not have the means to get transport, paperwork, whatever, to be at a different school site. Exactly. And like, We've talked about housing prices and how they are tied to test scores. Test scores are tied to the school itself. Test scores are affected by having money or not having money for a million different reasons. We have an episode about that. Like all of this, I just don't think it's fair to like say it's Title One. Like we said, 63%. Uh. Mm. And the fact, what does that say about the education system? That 63% of schools, the majority like of kids are in households that qualify for government assistance. That shows pretty much everyone with means to get their kid out of the public school system has done it. That's not a good sign. It's really not. And that's the thing that like, that's why I sound like a conspiracy theorist when I'm like, it's systemic. It's part of the system. It's not a bug. It's a feature. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. they don't care about and by they i mean like conservative people like republicans don't give a f about public school necessarily because their kids aren't there and that's not where they're putting their money you know not where i live but in another place there's like a big drama right now because a guy that's running for some some local office thing his kids don't go to public schools and everyone's like mad at him about it because I think he might be running for not school board, but like something with relation to schools. And all of his kids go to private or charter schools. He doesn't have a single kid in public school. Wow. Imagine that. This is interesting. I think it should be a requirement that if you're in Congress, your kids have to go to the public school that you like live in. Because you probably I... live in a nice neighborhood. So it's probably fine. I... <laughs> 
would agree. I also think that if you have, if you're a teacher, you should be able to live where you teach and your kids should be able to go where you teach. Yes. Like if have, you're a government if employee, you that. should be up in there. I just think like it sucks because like what I'm saying that I'm thinking of when I taught in LA in Mar Vista yeah. and I couldn't afford to live within an hour and a half of there. I ended up living in freaking Reseda off the 405 in a studio for $1,300 a month, you know? Like, that's crazy. You meant that it from, like, a, like a economic perspective. I meant from an emotional perspective. I don't know if right. I could be in the same building as my own children. Because, like, totally if fair. my class got interrupted because you're f***ing math, everybody's having a bad day, especially you now. Like, yeah. I got 30 other kids in the room, and you have the audacity to f*** up. That's what I was talking to my coworker about, is I was like, I can't, like, if I have kids, I can't be a classroom teacher, because when my students have problems, I'm very empathetic, because I don't know what their home life is like. So when they're, like, not doing their work, or they're being rude, or they're sleeping, I'm like, oh, maybe this happened to you, maybe you didn't sleep last night, I don't know what's going on at home. Like, that's always what I tell myself to kind of, like, make sure I'm nice to them. I never right. know what's going on at home. But if it was my child, your house is my house and I f feed you. So you better be getting all A's right now. Like, I know oh you had God. dinner last night and went to sleep. So yeah. what's, what's the problem? I looked up Title I on Reddit and I kind of regret it now because people are being <laughs> annoying. This person, it's a thread with teachers and it says, teach in a Title I school, but don't send your kids there. And it's from a high school teacher who teaches in a Title I school and is debating where to send her child. So she basically says, one thing she says that I think she's kind of wrong about, I think it just varies school to school, is she says that you're less micromanaged in a Title I school. I don't think that's true. I think, like we said, 63%. I think it varies a ton. But this is her concern, is she said, our neighborhood school is also title one i'm assuming she works at the high school because she's talking about her kindergartner our neighborhood school is title one with very low scores but i really like the teachers and they seem well supported and her concern is that she's worried about her daughter's like academic peer group and the expectations because then people in the thread start to talk about how like i work at a title one school my principal once suggested that a student should be able to draw a picture instead of writing an essay and for a high schooler, I don't think that's appropriate. And some things about how a lot of times in a low income school that doesn't have resources, we know that academic expectations often get lowered. So that was her concern is that like she does, she wants her daughter to be really challenged at school. She doesn't want her to be the number one kid in the class. So I think that is a fair point. But like we said, 63%. I'm sure there's a lot of Title I schools that are very academically rigorous. Mm hmm. My experience in the Title I schools I have worked at is I think that that was not the case and we were not academically rigorous enough. And I think that those kids were not on grade level. But that's felt, also true across America. Yeah. But and when I worked at a Title I school for kindergarten, I felt that we were too academically rigorous. That's what I was about to say. I feel like a lot of Title I schools tend to be overly rigorous in testing and under rigorous in actual work and day-to-day -day student writing and outcomes and more subjective things. And that's been the case at both the Title I schools I've worked at. I felt like we harped so much on testing and test scores but the kids like writing and being able to come up with ideas and like being able to have their inference skills and their creativity, things that are harder to measure. I felt like that was where it, we were really lacking. Yeah. And I kind of think that's what this Reddit thread is kind of getting at that a lot of times title one, and this is true, like when you get funding, you're supposed to show that it worked. So I think Title I schools do tend to really focus on test scores to show like, look, we spent this money and this is the difference that it made. The graph is green. The graph is yellow. Right. And it's like we already know that the testing system itself is flawed. This was kind of just a chatting episode. We're chatting about Title I, how the Republicans are cutting it. It seems like our final conclusion is that getting money is awesome, but it would be way cooler if we just had equitably funded schools to begin with and then we wouldn't need a separate program to have yeah. money if you could just give us money the first time would be better it would be amazing in fact would love yeah. that just if you guys were open to any suggestions just give all of us the money all of it yeah seriously I'll take it. we love money well let us know what you we think love money 
We hope that you have a good day. And if you work at a Title I school and you listen to this podcast, thanks for not being weird or racist about it. And if you are being weird or racist about it, now you know better. So you have no excuses anymore. The if more you, you get know, canceled the more you on calls. Facebook, I'll find it and enter your comment section on your personal Facebook page. All right. We love right. you. Miss Frazzle's being attacked. Just as a disclaimer, because I am someone who is actively teaching, everything on this podcast is my personal opinion and does not reflect my district, my state, my employer, my students, or my admin. Everything on this podcast was recorded on personal time, on personal equipment, and is a completely separate endeavor from my school district. Yeah, leave her alone.